Okay. Oh, okay. It's good now? Um, sort of, kind of. I think if you stand in the middle. Maybe I'll stand in the middle. Okay. Okay. This is better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, why do you need online components, right? And uh, uh, so the number one reason is cold start, right? New users and new items keep coming to the system continuously you know, on most web app, in most web applications, right? And uh, how do you do? How do you obtain data for new items and new users, right? So one way is to do explore exploit. That's an online computation which you have to do. Uh, once you get data available, how do you adapt your estimate very quickly to provide better estimates for these new users and new items that come to your uh, system, right? So that's what I'm going to talk about, right? How do you collect data? so that you can deal with the cold start problem through explore exploit methodologies. And once you collect this data, how do you update your models to kind of reflect the information very quickly right? and improve the recommendations? Okay. Then there is also concept drift. right? So most of the web applications are highly non-stationary and things change over time, so you have to constantly be adapting. Even if you don't have items that are too ephemeral, you still want to adapt your system because things could be non-stationary, right? Users' behavior might change. A big event in the world can completely change users' preference for items. And, and your old models may not be germane anymore. And if you take a long time, then you, again, may not um, engage the users as much as you could if you continuously adapt your system. OK? Um, OK. So this, this is how I'm going to go about it, right? So I'm going to talk about some time series model and initialization, explore, exploit. Let's see uh, how far we go. Uh, OK, so in order to understand, let's go back to our old example of doing most popular recommendation, right? Again, this is meant to be a baseline. It is meant more. I'm using it more for ex expository reasons than anything else, but it helps us understand because the math is simple. You can see what's going on rather than going more complex right away, right? Okay, so no personalization. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about all these three components. And by the way, this model, although it looks very simple, sometimes it's pretty hard to beat. Like, if, even if you try to personalize, Sometimes this is very hard to beat in terms of a metric. So it's good to have this anyways in your system, even if you are going for a more complex model, because the baseline is strong. Okay. And again, it is easy to extend this, right? So you can still do light personalization if you have implemented this. How? You can just create some coarse user segments, and then you run most popular within each of these segments. So light personalization is even possible with this method. Okay. Right, so this is the usual recommendation problem. I talked about this, and uh, you know these are the challenges. We know about that. The same old example, right? And the thing I want to to focus on is uh, articles here of short lifetimes. There are temporal effects, and there are often breaking news stories that come up, and so you have to react to that very fast, right? These are the main things, right? Uh, uh, this is all. I've already talked about these things for this application, so. Right, so, so the first problem is how do you track CTR over time? Right, you have already seen that CTR kind of having <coughs> strong non-stationary patterns. Right, so how wh what kind of time series models you can build? Right, and so one model is the Kalman filter model. Uh, so there are some other options. So, the simplest option is in order to predict the next time interval, you look at the clicks and views in the previous time interval per article and just estimate the CTR based on the previous time interval. Now, this is going to have very high variance, as we all know, right? Uh, because in, for many articles, the number of times you showed that articles in the last 10 minutes or five minutes would be extremely small, right? So you get very unstable numbers. The other is just count the total number of clicks that have been obtained by that item since, uh, since it was born and the total number of times it has been shown and just add them up. Now. That is stable, but it reacts to changes slowly, right? If there is a big diurnal pattern, it will take a long time to adapt to that. The other thing is moving window, right? You look at a small window. OK, let me look at the last one hour and then estimate CTR based on the data I have about an item for the last one hour. That's the moving average approach, and uh, that, re that is reasonable. 
but it is not very easy to incorporate prior information you may have about the article in a very natural way when you're doing moving average. You can do it, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it's not very natural, right? Right? So one way is to just use a generative model, right? Uh, I mean, you know, if you have prior information, you can easily incorporate that. It does what you get out of moving average. It kind of gives more weight to recent data and less weight to past data, except that the uh, decay function is slightly different, but it st still does the same thing. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You can incorporate prior information, and you can also do what you want to do, which is weigh the recent data more than the past data. Uh, right, so that is one way of doing it, right? So this is for a given item. The number of clicks you get is, let's say it's a Poisson or binomial, and then you have a state equation, and then you know these are, your, uh, this is the model parameter you have about, uh, this is the prior distribution you have for the item at the first time interval. It has some mean and some variance, right? And the eta determines how, much weight you give to more recent data than the past data, right? So if the eta is very large, then you give more weight to more recent data. If eta is small, then you give less weight to recent, you kind of uniformly weight data, historical data, right? And you can easily solve this recursively by using usual procedures. Uh, this is what the graphical representation looks like. I'm not going to go through the equation, but you can solve this um, from first principles by using the usual Kalman filter and Bayesian machinery, right? And at the end of the day, you know, this is your estimated CTR for the next time interval. It's a gamma distribution with this mean and this variance. And the mean is exactly the same as the posterior mean you had in the previous time interval. And the variance is the posterior variance ha you had in the previous time interval plus some dilation, right? If you don't have any dilation, then the posterior variance will keep tightening up and you will not give more weight to recent data. And so you have to dilate the variance a little bit. And the dilation will depend on this eta parameter. It will depend on whether the article has high CTR or not. So if you have articles with very high CTR, they will adapt more quickly than articles that have lower CTR. And of course, the prior variance, right? So this is an example. Like So this is the model that was fitted by using this previous data. So one thing I want you to see here is articles that have higher CTR are more adaptive than articles that have lower CTR. And that's because of the multiplicative state equation. When you have a multiplicative state equation, the, the window that is used to weight recent data changes. Right? Articles that tend to have more clicks will use smaller time window. Articles that have fewer clicks will use a larger time window. That's what multiplicative state equation does for you. If you have an additive state equation, then that would not happen. Everybody will have the same kind of weighting. But for these kind of applications, this makes more sense. Because the more clicks you have, the more data you have, and you can be more adaptive without being killed by the variance of your estimates. Right? So that's the main idea here. Okay? <clears throat> you can also use all the historical data about items you have to come up with better estimates of prior means and prior variance. Right? So what you can do is you can say, okay, well, in the past, I have shown a million items on the Yahoo front page. Let me take that data and figure out what kind of starting point is going to give me the best explanation of the curves I've seen, right? You can do that, and that's what this is doing, right? Without going through the details, that's what it is doing. It's taking all the historical items, looking at all the time series trajectories, and figuring out what prior estimate is going to explain those trajectories in the best possible way, okay? So you can do that. Uh, even without requiring any metadata on the item, you can get a good prior mean and prior variance. So that's why I meant by intelligent initialization. But just using the historical item data, you can come up with a better way to start your uh, estimates for new items that are going to be seen in the system. So this is not absolute cold start. Absolute cold start is some product manager launched a product today and you have not seen this at all in your life before. Right? This is. The Yahoo front page has been running since 1995, so you have a lot of data, right? So this is not absolute cold start. Okay. Okay, so now how do you do explore exploit, right? So before I go into the solution, let me first describe the problem, right? And then, you know, we, we'll go as many, we will do as many solutions as we can in the talk, but I want to make sure you know exactly what the problem is, right? Mathematically, so that you can think about it, right? So you are here, at any given point in time, you are in interval t. Let's say each interval is of 10 minutes length, right? So you are here, you have k different items, 
and you want to decide what fraction of page view should go to item one, what fraction of page view should go to item two, and so on and so forth in the next time interval. Okay? So this is the design you want, right? You have k items, let's say you have 100 items, you want to decide in the next time interval, should I give 2% of page views to item one, or should I give 3% to item one? How, how much, right? And if these x, so these x's are your design parameters, right? You're trying to figure out what is the best fractional allocation scheme you can come up with in the next time interval to improve the overall clicks of the system in the long term. And this is again uh, ignoring personalization and all that stuff, right? I've already told you that, right? So this is a design problem, right? And you have all the data you have seen so far to kind of make this decision. So what's the best you can do? So if you are myopic, you will say, well, let me look at the empirical CTR of all articles. The one that has the highest CTR gets 100% of the page views in the next interval. Everything else gets zero. That's a myopic solution, greedy solution, or you can call it the greedy solution. It does not look forward. It just looks at the instantaneous CTR and makes a decision based on that. And in the next time interval, that the article that has the highest empirical CTR gets 100% of the page views. And then you again recompute your empirical CTRs and do the same thing for the next time interval, right? So that's, that's a design. It's not the most efficient because it's not going to give you the best solution as you're going to see, okay? So is the problem definition clear? Okay. Right, so, okay. Yeah, so in order to come up with a solution, you should not look at what has just transpired. You should also try to look ahead in the future. If I take a particular action in the next time interval, what impact is it going to have in the future? Right? That's the key here. And that's why the computation becomes difficult. Right? If I show you to, if I dedicate 2% of the page views to article one, article two, article three, and then the rest to article five, I'm going to get some data, hypothetical data out of that. I'm going to revise my estimate out of that hypothetical data. What is that going to do for the next time interval? That's the computation you have to do. And then I'm going to get another data out of that, and that's going to impact my third time interval. So smells like dynamic programming, right? I mean, and, you know, that's what it is at the end of the day. Okay? Uh, this is the good old picture for two items, right? Right? And as I was saying, if you have to just make a single decision, the myopic is the best, right? If, if the Yahoo front page is going to shut down after five minutes, that's the best you can do, right? Take the best empirical CTR article, show it, done, right? But that's not the case. You have to, you, you have to assume the Yahoo front page is going to be running for the next month. What is the best thing you can do to kind of make that monthly clicks uh, as much as possible, right? And that's why you have to look at the potential of an article to do well, right? right? So this article, although it has a lower mean CTR, it has the potential of being better than this particular article, right? And you can write down the potential as some tail expectation, right? This is the tail expectation, right? Okay. And as I was telling you, it is related to the multi-arm bandit, right? So every slot machine is like an article, and uh, just as in the multi-arm bandit literature, you have unknown payoffs, you have unknown CTRs, and there's a lot of literature here. Uh, uh, in the bandit literature, he, too, you, know, you have to pull the arm sequentially. You pull an arm, you see the feedback, you make the next optimal decision, right? So it's the same kind of problem, uh, right? And uh, there are two ways. One popular way of measuring the uh, quality of a bandit policy is what is called regret. So what is a regret? If I knew the true CTR, I know what I can get. And now if I run a scheme, how much do I lose relative to that, right? That's the regret of the scheme, right? So it's often used as a way to measure the quality of a bandit scheme, right? Oh. Okay, right? And so there are two different ways of solving the bandit problems in the literature. One is the Bayesian approach, where you, where you seek to find the Bayes optimal solution by writing down an MDP. Of course, with the, it depends on the assumptions you make on the distribution, right? So if you're taking the Bayesian approach, the quality of the solution really depends on what kind of modeling you are doing, right? If your models are good, then you'll get very good answers. If the models are not very good, it will not be very good. And then there is more like a minimax kind of approach, which tends to find scheme that can bound the regret you incur by some factor, like logarithmic factor, right? 
And these are more robust to modeling assumptions. But you can often do a much better job of doing the Bayesian scheme if you do the modeling right. You will cut down the exploration by a lot. But again, you have to spend a lot of time doing the modeling, right? So that's the trade-off. If you're willing to do a good job of modeling, you are better off with the Bayesian schemes. If you don't have the time to do modeling and you just want to get something out of the door very quickly, then these schemes are not bad. It's at least giving you some sensible schemes to do exploration with, right? So both of them are useful in practice, especially when you're working in an industrial setting. Sometimes you won't have the time to do modeling. You have to roll out something in three days and then, oh, okay. Well, is there something I can do quickly? I don't want to do any machine learning or any probabilistic modeling because I don't have the time. Well, yeah, UCB is your friend. Just go and implement it, and you'll be okay, right? So it's good to know both. And again, having, having this as a baseline is also good, right? Because it kind of keeps you honest as far as your model quality is concerned. Right? So. Well, I would like to, let me skip some details I had as skip section here okay oops sorry something happened i did not want to skip there oh wow okay let me just skip to the wrong place sorry about that OK, sorry about that. Yeah, so I'm not going to go in detail with this slide, but this is how you can write the model as an MDP, right? So if you're interested in the Bayesian approach, then you can write it as an MDP, right? And so I'm going to go through just this last thing here. So this is the policy or the explore exploit scheme you want to construct. And so this is saying, OK, this is the value of my policy after t, t time intervals, right? I start with the initial state theta 0. The state could be the number of clicks and number of views you have for each article, right? So, and this is the value. And so this, what will be this value? Well, if I start with this state, uh, and if I use this explore exploit policy, I'm going to move to this state after one time interval, right? right? So if I start from this, I move to this. And then the value which I'm going to incur after this is going to be the value which I incur after t minus 1 if I had started with this, right? So the usual dynamic programming thing. and then. You know, you can write this expectation by using the transition probability of this to this, and so on and so forth. And then the goal is to really come up with an optimal solution to this MDP, which is not very easy, as we all know, right? MDPs are hard to solve computationally, right? And uh, I think the main breakthrough that happened uh, in this area was by Gittins. So what he said was, well, let's change the reward function to something like this, right? So instead of saying how much reward I'm going to get in t time intervals, Let's say, well, let's write down the total reward as something which is more like a geometric average of rewards from time zero to ad infinitum, right? So instead of looking at reward in a finite time interval, do an exponential weighted moving average uh, of the rewards by using this parameter. And then he was able to prove that the optimal policy which you will get can be solved by decoupling the problem, right? So instead of solving a joint optimization problem for k independent for k arms, you can actually solve it by solving k independent one-dimensional problems. Right? So for every arm, you compute what is called the Gittins index, priority of that arm, and then you choose the arm that has the highest priority, right? So every arm runs a one-dimensional optimization problem. It gives you the priority for that arm. And then you choose the arm that has the highest priority. That is the, so he showed that solution is an optimal solution to this MDP, right? which was a breakthrough result. Right? And so the main, uh, the, main, uh, the, the main takeaway from that is you can solve the k-dimensional problem by solving k-one-dimensional problems. That's really the main thing. Right? If you keep adding more arm, it doesn't matter. You just solve a few more one-dimensional problems. Okay? And the high-level idea is the Gittins index is something that measures the potential of the arm being good, right? So for instance, if I have to explain it very naively, this is not exactly Gittin's index, but if I have a CTR distribution of an article, instead of serving the, uh, instead of scoring articles by using the mean, you 
correlate by using the 95th percentile, for instance. Right? That's an optimistic estimate of the CTR. And so what Gittin's policy intuitively is saying is score the article based on their potential of being good rather than using the mean. Right? That's essentially what it is doing. Now, the kind of computations you have to do to estimate the potential is different than what I just described. But just to give you an idea, think about it that way. Right? Use the 95th percentile instead of the mean to measure the quality of an article. And this rank based on that, and you'll get something similar to what Gittin's index is talking about. OK, okay so I think uh, I'm not going through this. Uh, yeah, so there are ways of computing the Gittin's index, and there are a lot of papers talking about that. And I would especially recommend this paper by Lai et al., where he derived how to compute Gittin's index for exponential family distributions, right? So binomial, Poisson, all of that can be computed by using this paper. Uh, and then there is this minimax approach, right? So the one important work here is what is called the upper confidence bound policy. And the idea is similar to what I was just describing, right? So instead of ranking the arms just by using the empirical CTR, add some uncertainty estimate as well, right? So this gives you an estimate of how potential, what is the potential of that arm being good, right? And you just do that and you have a scheme, right? How you measure this potential determines how much exploration and exploitation you do, of course. So you have to do it carefully, but the idea is the same. Okay? So as you can see, there are no modeling assumption here in the UCB1 scheme, right? It's derived in a very non-parametric fashion, right? So n is the number of page views you already have. Ni is the number of page views you have for RMI, and then you just rank it based on that. Right, so I'm not going through that again. Uh, so this is the observed payoff. This is the payoff representing uncertainty, right? And that's the, and there are, you can show that this scheme has logarithmic bounds, <coughs> but unfortunately the constants in these bounds matter in practice. So if you write down the theorem, the constants don't seem to matter too much, but in practice, the constants do matter. Uh, you know, reducing that constant, tightening it up is actually important for getting good performance in practice. Right? There are some other schemes, heuristic schemes, that are often used in practice. Epsilon greedy, uh, we have already talked about that. You take a small fraction and randomly explore items, and then use all that data to learn about your system. It's not bad. If, you may have to spend some time to tweak the epsilon, but it's not a bad starting point in many web applications. Okay, so if you have nothing to start with, I would just recommend starting with epsilon greedy. Then there is something called softmax. So the beauty of softmax is you don't need to get any variance estimates, right? If you have the empirical CTR, you <coughs> modulate the probability of picking an arm i by using a temperature parameter, right? So if the temperature becomes infinite, then you are doing uniform exploration. If the temperature becomes zero, then you are kind of picking the arm with the best CTR. And so if you tweak this temperature carefully, I have seen in real life it works pretty well. But you have to tweak it. It is very sensitive to the choice of that parameter in empirical applications. And then something that has really gained a lot of acceptance recently is Thompson, Thompson sampling. So if you take a probabilistic framework and you can get the posterior distribution of your CTR estimates. What Thompson sampling is telling you is, you just draw a sample from your posterior distribution and use that as your score. <coughs> okay. So if I have a CTR distribution, beta binomial CTR distribution for article one, article two, instead of ranking the articles by their mean estimate, you draw a sample from these posteriors. For every visit, draw a sample from the posterior and use that as your score to rank order your items. So this is inherently introducing some jitter into your estimates. And the jitter is coming through the distribution itself. Right? And there have been papers recently that have also shown that this is logarithmically bounded. And uh, many people have used it in practice, including myself. And it is actually pretty good, right? It actually, it is simple, right? Because now you know the complexity of explore exploit is all gone, right? You, if you spend the time to build a good model, probabilistic model, and you, if the probabilistic model can spit out both the mean and variance estimates, you are in business, right? You have solved both the problems at the same time. Right? But you have to spend a lot more effort in coming up with good probabilistic models. Because now the probabilistic models cannot just give you the right estimate of the mode. They have to give you the right estimate of the posterior. Right? And that's a much harder problem. 
right? And so you have to be careful of that. <coughs> okay, so uh, so so that that was all about the multi-armed bandit problem. But you know, if you're in the recommender setting, there are some assumptions that are violated compared to the bandit literature. One is you have a dynamic set of arms. Most of many of the multi on bandit literature assumes you have a fixed set of arms, except for Wittel's paper. Wittel's kind of assumed that, you know, you, you know, he calls it the restless bandits. But that's, uh, other than that, there are, most of the papers assume that the set of arms are static. CTRs are assumed to be stationary. The payoff probabilities don't change in multi on bandit. Here it could change. And finally, I think this is very important. A multi arm bandit assumes that the feedback is available without any delay. You assume instantaneous feedback. In web, that doesn't happen, right? Because <coughs> once a user interacts with the article, I showed you that picture, the architecture diagram, right? The front end has to transmit the event. It takes time before it comes to the back end, and the data is available for processing, right? So realistically, it takes five to 10 minutes before you can actually re react to a feedback. So you have to come up with batched serving schemes which is different from what multi arm bandit literature talks about, okay? <coughs> so as a practical consideration, I think using Thompson sampling, softmax, these are epsilon greedy, they are very good practical solutions. And what you use would depend on how much work you have done, right? So you've not done any work in terms of modeling. Um, by modeling, I mean both the mean and variance, not just the mean. Then, you know, it's good to go with epsilon greedy first and then, you know, once you collect some randomized data from your system so that you can do offline evaluation, you start doing softmax. And, you know, the offline data will help you tweak the softmax parameters. And then once you have done softmax, hopefully by that time you have built a probabilistic model, then you can start doing Thompson sampling. So I will go in that order. Okay. Okay. Now... I think for the simple, uh, most popular problem, it turns out you can compute the Bayes optimal solution. So I was hoping to show you that uh, uh, we have 10 minutes. Maybe I'll just show you that. This is, this, I'm not recommending this be used in system at all. I mean, you can use it. We have used it on Yahoo front page and it actually works pretty well. But you don't necessarily have to use it. All I'm trying to show you here is how you do this computation from the first principles. So if you are doing more research in this area, you can latch on to the first principles we have here and extend it to the other problems as well, if you wish, right? Uh, all the other methods I talked about, Thompson sampling, softmax, UCB, these are all heuristics. Right? They're not Bayes optimal in any sense at all, right? But computing Bayes optimal for all the personalized recommendation is a hard problem. So I'm gonna show you how we do it for the most popular recommendation. We have not solved it for personalized recommendation. And hopefully you can do more research and use the ideas to generalize it to other problems as well, right? So, so that's the thing. So uh, the same view now. At T0, you have N0 views. At T1, you will have N1 views, right? So N1 page views now, N0 here, right? And let's try to do it for two articles, right? So item P is the one that has uncertain CTR. Item Q has been shown for a long time, and the CTR of that is exactly known, no, no, no uncertainty, right? So the CTR of item two is Q0 at the moment, and Q1 for the interval where you want to make a recommendation, okay? Uh, so this is what the picture looks like, the good old picture, right? And P0, Q0 is for the current time interval now. P1, Q1 is the hypothetical CTR which you're going to get in the next time interval, okay? And again, that will depend on how much page views you allocate to these things, right? That is important, right? So that's the problem. What fraction of the current page views where you have to make a decision needs to be allocated to item P? That's the design parameter you need to determine for this two item problem, right? What is the value of X? What is the optimum value of X for you? If you are just looking ahead two time intervals, right? What I do now, I want to see what I do now would impact the current interval and the next one, only two. In general, we want to do K, but let's say we do only two. What is the solution to this problem, right? And so in order to determine X, we have to estimate what will happen in the future. Once I give X page views to this item now, 
what repercussions will it have for the next time interval, and then do a calculation, right? So that's why uh, you need to do some more computation. So suppose I show a certain number of page views, right? Let's say I show X percent of N0 page views to item P, right? That's going to give me C hypothetical clicks, right? If I show it a million times, I'm going to get a certain number of clicks. If I show it 100 times, I'm going to get a certain number of clicks, right? So that C is a random variable, right? We're after showing this article. It's a random variable, right? Once I get, once I observe the hypothetical number of clicks which I'm going to get by showing this article, I can update the posterior distribution of that article, right? Based on the hypothetical clicks, right? So both if, if I know x and if I know what number of clicks I'm going to get, I'm going, I can update the posterior distribution from P0 to P1, right? And then if my game ends at the next time interval, I'm going to allocate all the page views to item P in the subsequent time interval if that posterior mean is bigger than Q1. Oh, you know, the Q1 is the CTR of the uncertain a certain article in the next time interval. If it is less than Q1, then I'm not going to give any page views to that article, right? Okay? Because if the game is going to end in the next time interval, in the next time interval, you got to be myopic. Give all the page views to the article which is the best and nothing to the other one, right? So that's, that's what happens, okay? Right? And this P1, the posterior mean which you're going to get for the uncertain article is a function of X, the more number of page views you give to that article, and also the hypothetical clicks you're going to get in the next time interval. Right? It's a function of both X and C. Okay? And so if you write down this equation by looking ahead two time intervals, this is the expected number of clicks you're going to get for the, for the system, right? So, X is the number of articles you, a number of pages you gave to the uncertain article. So X times P0 times, this is the number of pages you have, and this is the uncertain article. And this is the, uh, this is the important thing, right? So if this guy is bigger than this, then all the page views go to the uh, uncertain article in the subsequent time view. If this guy is less than this, then all the page view goes to the certain article in the subsequent time interval, right? So you have to compute the expectation of this with respect to the marginal distribution of the hypothetical number of clicks you are going to get in this time interval. We're doing a two-stage calculation here, right? And uh, you know, if you solve it, so this is what this is the number of clicks you would have obtained if you had shown only the certain articles in both the time intervals, right? After rearranging the terms, so this is this is the amount this is the gain in clicks you get by doing this uh, explore exploit scheme, right? And your goal is to find the value of x that is going to maximize the gain you get, additional gain you get over showing the my over following the myopic scheme, right? So that's the well-defined optimization problem, and. Uh, you can solve it. I'm not going to go through the solution. You can write down the gain function, and you can solve it, and you can get an optimal answer for this, right? So this is how the scheme, uh, you can actually do this computation from the first principle and get an optimal solution, right? You don't have to, and the reason you can't just appeal to something in the literature and apply it as it is is because the assumptions are violated. That's why you have to start from the first principle. Okay. Right, and uh, okay, so I'm not going to go through the quiz and all. Uh, then you can generalize this to K items as well by using some Lagrange relaxation technique. I think most of the material is borrowed from Whittle's paper in 1980s. He also did some similar computation for restless bandits. Right, and uh, from two intervals, you can generalize it to multiple intervals as well. Uh, you can generalize it to non-stationary CTRs as well. It doesn't matter what your distribution is. As long as you have a probabilistic model that can give you the posterior distribution, you can just plug it in and it will all work in this framework. Okay? Then we ran some simulation with this scheme and compared it with the other schemes. And obviously it is better because otherwise I won't be discussing this. Um, okay, but that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make here is what we have seen in the simulation is if your data is modeled very well, by the distribution, then the Bayesian scheme is much better than using the other schemes, right? So and that's the message I was giving you even at the beginning of the section, right? And, uh, right, so 
yeah, I think uh, I, I don't have to explain the other things, right? So I'm just going to go through this plot, right? So this is the base two by two, base general. Again, these are two different variations of what I was describing for two items. This is a UCB scheme, the usual UCB scheme, then epsilon greedy, soft max, and you know, this is the average number of articles you have in every single interval, right? So if the item pool becomes larger, the quality of the schemes becomes different, right? And this is the regret, right? As you can see, it is natural, right? If the number of articles becomes larger, then the regret generally tends to increase, right? Because uh, you, the explore-exploit problem becomes more challenging, right? So these are the Bayes, Bayesian schemes right here. Right? And you can see the regret is uniformly lower than all the other schemes, right? Uh, but that's because the data follows the distributional assumptions I have made, right? Uh, if you do a simulation where you fit a completely wrong distribution, then this won't hold anymore, right? But if the distributional assumptions are right, then it seems like the Bayesian schemes are much better. Uh, the softmax is not that bad, and again, the curve I'm showing you here was obtained by doing a lot of tuning. So I'm showing you the best softmax variant for this data. If you don't do tuning, then the softmax performance could be rather arbitrary. You have to be careful of how you tweak. The UCB scheme tends to do more exploration in general. If you use the UCB as it is, the variance estimates are rather generous because it's based on non-parametric churn of hovering bounds, so it tends to over-explore. Um, but that's the problem. Okay. So, okay, so with that, I think uh, we are out of time today, so we can continue tomorrow. I will, tomorrow I'm going to cover some online up model update scheme, and I'm going to cover multi-objective optimization with an example. <laughs>